Hi, good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Ankur Lard from Horiba Medical, your host for today. I, wel I welcome you all to the, our live webinar. First of all, let me thank you for attending this webinar. Uh, today's topic is monsoon fever and role of hematology analyzer. As refreshing it may feel, the onset of rain brings host of diseases and infections that can pose a serious range of health threats. During monsoon, the change in the weather opens up a new window for bacteria and viruses to flourish, thereby making us sick. Puddles of rainwater, stagnant and clean water, and water logging becomes ideal breeding ground for mosquitoes, giving rise to vector-borne diseases like dengue, malaria, chikungunya, and it also gives rise to waterborne diseases like typhoid, leptospirosis, cholera, hepatitis A. And in the same way, drastic temperature fluctuation, which happens during rainy season, and weaken immunity, increases chances of flu and influenza. In this, pic this picture depicts it all. You can see various diseases in the monsoon season, like fever, malaria, cholera, hepatitis, dengue, etc. Most of uh, the monsoon illness shows high temperature as the major and common symptom. And we all would agree that to diagnose cause of fever, plethora of tests are available. But the most important and easily accessible in this investigation is through hemat analyzer. CBC is well documented and reliable tool for screening and monitoring of infections and is being used as the first line of investigation for almost all medical conditions. And the new parameters developed on the hemat analyzers like malarial flagging, dengue flagging, CRP, NLR, GLR are giving new dimension to the field of diagnosis. So how good these new parameters are, how good these flaggings are, how important these are, how useful these are. Let's explore all this in detail. And let's explore all this in detail. If there are any queries, we can write, you can write in the chat box and we will try to answer it after the presentation. Without wasting much time, I would like to call Dr. Handu. His name doesn't need any introduction. He's senior consultant, hematologist, and senior director, hospital lab services, academic affairs, research, and continuing education at the Max Healthcare Institute Limited, Dr. B. L. Kapoor Memorial Hospital, New Delhi. He's MD pathology, and he has done fellowship in hematological medicine from United Kingdom and fellowship in flow cytometry from Australia. He has vast experience of more than 18 years, and he has more than 25 papers and publications to his grade. He has been an NBL, NBL assessor, and the list goes on. Sir, we are privileged to have you here. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, and thank you, Horeba, for having me yet again for another webinar today. And the topic that I've been assigned is monsoon fever, the role of hematology. Analyzer. Now, uh, when we think of monsoon, you know, at least when I start thinking of monsoon, what comes to my mind? The word monsoon only rings this particular bell in my mind, and that's about the movie Monsoon Wedding. And I'm not sure how many of you would have seen this movie, but for the simple fact that this particular gentleman over here would always be just carrying his phone and even get on to and latch on to all the possible high positions just to catch the uh, network you know things have changed drastically of course monsoon wedding has also you know moved on and however if you look at monsoon today what comes to your mind is something like this this is what happened in delhi recently uh, you had a deluge which was there at minto bridge and it was like covering the entire area in that and so much so that people even died now, we know that we are amongst COVID times, and obviously nobody would want to really have this kind of a picture in front of you. So what brings uh, very nice and uh, beautiful memories to my mind is the pictures like these. You know, you have these subtle rain, you have this subtle uh, cloudiness, and then, of course, you walk through the water and you, in the backwaters of Kerala, which we used to go so many times, it used to be fun in monsoons. Now, while this keeps happening, you also realize at the same time that monsoon gets you to a big spectrum of diseases. You know, it exposes you to a lot of diseases and all because of so many vectors who actually take 
the onus of spreading the disease around. The most common one amongst them being these mosquitoes. And of course, you have the rats and the fleas and the things like that. And of course, lots of animals also contribute to these diseases. And the award actually goes to this particular uh, you know, organism or the vector, which is the mosquito. And it's a female mosquito, which actually starts giving you this disease and spreads this disease all across uh, you know, uh, the human uh, beings. And when you have diseases which are spread uh, by this kind of a mosquito, especially the dengue and the, and the malaria, you have these wards, which are generally full of patients. And you have people who are just thronging the blood banks. And in these blood banks, what is happening, people are just giving platelets for their kith and kin and trying to ensure that the people get whatever platelets they need to have. And of course, at the same time, nothing is out of politics in our country. So there is also a lot of politics which keeps happening at the same time with respect to malaria. And uh, of course, the politicians want to make sure that they provide things free to the people, but by putting their hands in somebody else's pocket, and they ask you to, you know, give these platelets to the patient, platelet counts to the patient at just rupees 50 and whatever. Now, when these things happen, the number of diseases which we have to actually cater to in monsoon suddenly increases. And I hope amongst these COVID times, we do not have such a big deluge of these diseases as well, so that we are not into trouble. But if there is, then we should be able to diagnose them without much difficulty. Now, this is where I'll be getting a hematology analyzer into the picture because hematology analyzer fortunately happens to be one of the instruments which is used most often in investigating any individual. And in fact, CBC happens to be one of the most commonly ordered tests across the globe. So in my talk, I'll be basically giving you a little bit of a historical aspect aspects about a hematology analyzer. I'll talk about dengue and how automated platelet counting has actually given us some information and how we, we are able to actually look at the analyzer and give us this information. We'll also look at certain cells called high fluorescence lymphocytes, which are seen specifically in dengue. We'll talk about detection of malaria on the analyzer. And we'll also see some studies with, where they have claimed leptospira being diagnosed based on CBC. And of course, to add the last flavor, the COVID, which we are still grip, grappling with. OK, so this particular picture is important only for one simple aspect that whenever you just take a sample of blood and you push it into the analyzer, the first thing that happens is that this sample of blood is sucked in into the analy analyzer and then it's divided into two main channels. And that's so very important because if we understand this particular aspect, it will resolve a lot of issues how we are able to pick up you know, uh, the information from the analyzer subsequently. So the first two steps which happen is one step which goes into the RBC and the platelet channel and the other one which goes into the WBC channel. And I'll not get into details of this because my aim is not to tell you about the hematology analyzer functioning here, but just to understand one very simple thing that RBCs and platelets are somewhere together and that's where they're counted together. And that's why they can influence one another. Whereas the WBCs on the other side, they have lysis of red blood cells and the platelets are also removed from the analysis. And therefore, because the WBC, RBCs and the platelets are removed from the analysis, it's only the WBCs which get analyzed in the rest of the chamber. So this is important for us to remember. And we would not have been even discussing today about this, but for the help of these people you know, who were there, the Kulta brothers, who were the ones who actually gave us this instrument? This is the Wallace Coulter and the Joseph Coulter, the brothers together gave us what is called the Coulter principle. And basis on this Coulter principle, you're getting these oscillations and subsequent to these oscillations, you're able to actually give us the information regarding various cell types. So if you notice, the cells which are smaller will give a smaller oscillation, whereas the cells which are larger will give you larger oscillation and therefore basis the size you're able to differentiate between various cell subtypes. Now, this is how it happens. You have this aperture and you have a positive and a negative electrode. You have these small cells, particles which are passing through and they give their respective, uh, what you call those curves and the graphs. All right. Now, while we are doing all that, we need to remember that platelets and RBCs, which I showed you in the first picture itself, they happen to be counted in the same channel. And the moment they count, get counted in the same channel, the only differentiating possibility between the two is primarily based on the cell size. So if you look at this particular graph here, 
the size which is larger are the RVCs and the size which is smaller are the platelets. But there are these areas of overlap between the RVCs and the platelets wherein there becomes a, comes the problem. The problem is that larger platelets will be coming into the RBCs and smaller RBCs will get into the platelets. And therefore, many a times when you have fragmented red cells or severely hypochromic microcytic red cells or larger platelets, they will interfere in the analysis and therefore give you variable counts. Now, you have to imagine one very important thing. The RBCs are far more in number and obviously their influence on the platelets is always going to be much higher compared to the platelets which are comparatively lesser in number and obviously the influence of the platelets on the RBCs is relatively lesser. And that's why you understand that RBCs are going to give you a more problem in the platelets than vice versa. So to handle this, obviously one needs to understand that analyzer companies are trying their level best to give you better and better information just for the information of the people who have locked in. We need to remember that the spike or the peak which you see the spike at the left end of the histogram, how can it be affected? It can be affected by cytoplasmic fragments. And of course, you're expected to review the smear in such a case. And if you have a spike on the right, cent right side of the, gra uh, of the graph of platelets, they are usually affected by schistocytes and microcytes and of course, the giant platelets. And of course, in this case also, you will review a smear. When you have a bimodal peak, that means you have a peak which is towards the left as well as the right side. And that means your analyzer is completely lost and it's not able to give you any information even in such a circumstance, you will need to review a smear. So for all practical purposes, when you have very fine and a beautiful uh, you know, picture in terms of the impedance, you are able to pick up the platelet counting very nicely. However, when these things don't happen, obviously one wants to get better information. So how do you get better information? There are a lot of companies and a lot of instrument manufacturers, including Horeba, which give you a possibility of looking at optical possibility of looking at platelets. And you're basically not using the impedance here or not using the current, but instead you're using the light scatter properties and the size of the cells at the same time and deciding that where are you finding your platelets and the red blood cells. So if you look at this particular picture here, what it is showing is you're able to identify your platelets very clearly separately compared to what you're seeing on the other side and these all these other red blood cells and this is supposedly giving you a better information with respect to the platelet count all right i think this is a lot of it is technical which a lot of us already know and have been talked about many many times before so we'll restrict ourselves to the disease state now and move on to the disease per se so the first disease that i'm trying to talk about is dengue and dengue of course uh, the number of cases uh, which we have seen in the past have been many. And in fact, unfortunately, what we have noticed is since last few days, the number of dengue cases have started coming up. Now, this is one particular slide which I like to show in my presentation is because this particular slide, uh, Dr. Kunal from Hinduja had shown in one of his presentation where he showed immature platelet fraction, you know, uh, neighbors envy and owners pride. And I don't know how many of you would know that Onida TV used to be one of the advertisements where this gentleman would come and would say Onida TV, if you have it, owners envy and neighbors pride would be what would be compared here. And mind you, when I did not have the IPF available with me in my laboratory, I used to feel this so very often. And therefore, this slide comes into my presentations most of the times. Now, what is so great about this immature platelet fraction? The immature platelet fraction is, is an index of thrombopoiesis. That means it's basically trying to tell us whether the manufacturing of platelets is happening inside the megakaryocyte or not, inside the bone marrow or not. And if the IPF levels are low and you have thrombocytopenia, it basically indicates that the marrow is not functioning adequately. So if you look at IPF, it reflects production of platelets and that's what we need to keep in our mind. And mind you, the reticulocyte, what reticulocyte is to the red blood cells during its synthesis. Similarly, reticulated platelets, rather than calling them immature platelets, are the ones which are important for the thrombopoiesis or the platelet production. And therefore, it is an indicator of manufacturing of the platelets within the bone marrow. All right. So if you have a higher in immature platelet fraction, that means there is increased platelet production by the marrow. Or in other words, it's also telling you that a lot of these platelets are actually getting destroyed in the peripheral blood. On the contrary, if you have a low or a normal IPF, and that indicates that the marrow is not producing adequate number of platelets, and it may not be something which is affecting in the periphery. 
So if high IPF is over, when the crisis is over, the IPF should come back to normal. So that's what one point needs to be kept in mind. And basis this only, uh, you know, a study was done by my colleague, Dr. Tina, in her previous place of work. And I'm just sharing one of the cases from her presentation here. So if you notice what happened is that the patient was a case of dengue and post dengue, we know that the platelets go down and that's what happened in this patient as well. So the platelets started falling. Just follow this yellow line, which you're seeing over here and the platelets kept falling. At the same time, when the IPF was being, you know, uh, seen from the analyzer, the IPF kept on increasing and it reached a certain point at 13.9, beyond which it started reducing. And that's the time when the platelets started coming up as well. This itself was an indicator that the moment you are following up IPF and you're getting a stable value of IPF, your platelets are just going to recover. So the analysis which was done in this particular study was to see recovery from the peak recovery from the rising trend and the falling trend and recovery from a single peak of value of IPF at 10%. Of course, this was eventually published as well. So remember, there was a recovery from the peak, which could be seen in this particular case. There is also a recovery which could be seen from the rising trend. And of course, you could also see that there was a recovery at the falling trend of IPF. So you had a rising trend and a falling trend. And of course, in all of them, you could see that the recovery was just around the corner. This eventually was seen as a, one of the, this is one of the cases where it was clearly demonstrated that as you have falling platelets, you have increase in the immature platelet fraction. And as you have the platelet fraction, which is like getting stabilized at a certain point, the platelets are just going to recover the very next day. And that's what happens. And this actually helped to reduce the number of platelet transfusions in such patients and therefore became such a very important study. And it was eventually published also in the International Journal of Laboratory Hematology. So immature platelet fraction in dengue is actually a potential tool for predicting platelet recovery in dengue patients, especially the ones having thrombocytopenia. This particular study did talk about a 10% value. Of course, it was later on predicted that this was not the right potential value. So instead of that, one would need to have a stability of the value rather than a 10% value. This got published, as I told you, in the International Journal of Laboratory Hematology and incidentally got awarded three times across the globe, not only in the uh, ISLH, but also from the Indian Ocean Rim Congress and one more place in Europe. So all these, so this study in itself was such a beautiful study, which eventually got replicated all across the country and almost everybody else decided that IPF is the best thing that one can get. And that's how this neighbor's envy and owner's pride concept came in. Okay, let's look at the other case. Uh, does IPF only help in dengue? Not really, because if you look at it, I'm just showing you another case here where there, there was a patient, you know, whose platelet counts were low and were also having low IPF. In, in this particular case, eventually when we did an uh, CBC, we looked at the MCV was high. And in all such cases, when we gave a B12 and folate, which was markedly reduced and we administered B12, there was an appropriate rise and fall of IPF. So this itself tells you very clearly that IPF not only has an importance there, it also has importance when you're trying to look at other diseases. Just to show you one more case about IPF, this is third case where we had a case of dengue as well as concomitant, uh, you know, in ITP within the thing, because many a times the dengue can also affect the megakaryocytes and the production of platelets may be affected markedly. And this is what happened in this particular patient. Your platelets, were hovering around 22,000 and he was also a dengue patient, but at the same time, the patient has associated ITP and therefore it gave us a lower IPF values. Thus, IPF became an important parameter for us to you know, work on. Patient was given concomitant steroids and that's when the IPF started falling and the platelets started going up. So therefore, dengue and concomitant associated illnesses can potentially be looked at by looking at IPF. All right. Remember one very important aspect, and that's about the coefficient of variation. IPF at a lower value will have a higher CV. And other than that, if you have a higher IPF, the CV will be lower. And there is no surprise to that because the moment the numbers are higher, the CV will obviously be better. So if I conclude, my first conclusion is IPF can be used to predict the platelet recovery in dengue patients having thrombocytopenia. A single value of 10% may be indicative, but we must remember that it's the stability of the values which is far more important. And associated B12 or ITP can be diagnosed on IPF and platelet correlation, even in the patients suffering from dengue. 
Okay, that takes me to the next thing, which is the new kid on the block. And what is the new kid on the block that we have? This is what is called the high fluorescent cells. Of course, there are analyzers where you call it high fluorescence lymphocytes. Others call it high fluorescent cells, etc. Now, it all depends upon what analyzer you're using and it depends on what the way they are actually looking at the cells from that angle. The ones which we looked at was calling it high fluorescent cells. And this is what we found from this analyzer, which gave us a very interesting flag of abnormal or atypical lymphocytes. And how does it come about? This is a very, very characteristic lymphocytic picture, a figure of eight picture that you get in this particular case. And the moment you find this kind of a picture, especially in a patient who is having febrile illness, you should be almost assured that this should be dengue. And uh, again, just to show you how this looks like very clearly, this is a case wherein you have dengue. And all these are these kind of plasmacytoid lymphocytes or uh, what you call those monocytoid lymphocytes, which you see in dengue and you're able to pick them up from the peripheral blood. Much that I would like to make you believe this, you really need to see it for yourself to believe that I, what I'm saying is right. Because all these cases, when you run them in the analyzer and you find this particular cell population, in more than 95% of the cases, your dengue test is going to be positive. So we did a study in this kind of a setting as well, wherein we looked at 121 patients in whom we did a positive dengue test. We had a positive dengue test, whether NS1 or IgM test. And of course, we looked at patients with a falling platelet count, you know, of 150,000 or lesser. And then we tried to see how it works out. Of course, we also had the cases which were other febrile illnesses where we wanted to make sure that we have a control group as well as a control group which is absolutely normal. Now, what was characteristic is this particular cell population, which is the high fluorescent cells. These are lymphocytes which are needed to be kept in mind. And what we talked about, how does the dengue of diagnosis of dengue come about is if you have a high fluorescent cell percentage of more than 5% and you have thrombocytopenia and you have an area where dengue at that point of time is endemic, your diagnosis is almost 98% positive for dengue. And this predicts also, we also then tried to see, can we use this particular parameter for predicting the recovery of platelets? And now this was a bit preposterous. If you look at it, you're trying to see a white cell and then trying to say that the white cell is going to, you know, give me an indication of recovery of platelets. And that was something which was a bit preposterous at that point of time. But eventually, when we looked at this particular case, we realized that the platelets and the high fluorescent cells do have a, you know, a, a correlation with one another. As you can see, the platelets were much higher initially. And with the advancement of dengue, the platelets started falling down, as you can follow this yellow line over here. And in the meanwhile, the high fluorescent cells started going up. The time the high fluorescent cells jumped up significantly, and I'll tell you about the jump a little later, we realized that the platelets are also about to going to come up. This was very, very interesting because here you did not need to run the sample in a separate retic mode or an optical mode to get hold of this information so that you are able to predict the platelet recovery. And we realized this repeatedly and we found that almost 90% of the cases we were able to figure it out with the jump of the high fluorescence. And what do we talk about jump of high fluorescence? When we talk about high fluorescence cell jump, if we had a base value of 0.2 to 4%, then we need to it to be five times. Between 0.5 to 0.9 percent, we need to be it needs to be four times, and between one to two percent, it just needs to be three times for us to call it a HFC jump. The moment we get an HFC jump, we know that the platelets are just around the corner. And this is what we proved subsequently in further cases as well. As you can see in this particular case, it's the same case which I'm trying to show you in a different format. All right. So important point is that whether you got a full recovery or a partial recovery within 48 hours you were able to predict the recovery for almost about 98 99 percent of the cases so what is the possible explanation that we have uh, we have possibly there are antibodies in the blood which cause destruction of the platelets and the first action of the cells is the b cells of course the second line of cytotoxic t cells this is what we think they are the hfcs they reduce the antibody and cause destruction of the plate disease destruction and platelets will start going up. We have this is only a hypothesis. We may or may not be right. And we will get to know once we have finished our study on the flow cytometry as well. Now, advantages over IPFR that it is obviously economical because we are not running it in a separate mode. And of course, it's not affected by any transfusions, any platelet transfusions.
So if I conclude, my second conclusion is that high fluorescent cells can be used as a surrogate marker in the diagnosis of dengue in thrombocytopenic patients. And it can also be used to predict recovery of platelets in dengue patients and therefore becomes an important integral part of our arm armamentarium from the analyzer itself. I will move on and this time I'll talk about malaria. Now we know that malaria is also around the corner because the moment you have rains, obviously post rains, you will have uh, the breeding of the mosquitoes and with them, obviously the malaria starts setting in. So when we look at malaria, this again needs to be remembered very nicely. I'm showing you this picture once again, only for one simple fact that we have divided the, uh, the, the blood into two components, one which is going into the WBC channel and one which is going into the RBC channel. We did talk about how RBCs and platelets will get, get affected, but we must also remember when we have this channel which is taking up the blood into the WBC, we lyse the RBCs. Obviously, there is a lysing reagent which is used in any of the hematology analyzers to lyse the red cells. Somehow, the parasitized red cells are resistant to lysis and they tend to remain intact and therefore they start showing up in the WBC channels in most of these analyzers and that's what's being exploited in majority of the analyzers to pick up the malaria and most of us call it what is called the malaria flag. So if you look at this, this is from the analyzer from Horeba, which is the YH550 scatter plots. And you are very categorically able to differentiate between various stages of the malarial parasite of Plasmodium vivax. And of course, there is a possibility of picking up gametocyte stage of Plasmodium falciparum as well. And depending upon which stage are you looking at, you will be able to differentiate between various stages as well, depending upon how the scatter plot shows up on your analyzer. So obviously we are analyzing on a WBC plot, but within the WBC plot, you're able to pick up these non-lysed parasitized red blood cells. And therefore you are able to get what is called the malaria flag. And obviously it is a beautiful thing to happen. This is from one of the different analyzers where the malaria has been looked at. And obviously there is differences. Sometimes you get a higher increase in eosinophils or sometimes you get higher increase or a different plot wherein you are getting a scatter of the neutrophils, where it's called pseudo-neutrophilia and pseudo-eosinophilia. And sometimes you're not able to differentiate between various cell types, but all of these have been taken together and then given what is called the malaria flagging. This is the same thing which has been seen in the previous analyzer as well. And on this analyzer, it is seen as well. Now, if you look at malaria uh, analyzer, if you are able to uh, malaria from the analyzer, the analyzer itself is able to give you this information. And this is again from one of the analyzers from Horeba, where the malaria is flagged directly from the instrument itself and gives you a suspect flag. You're just about supposed to look at the peripheral smear and it will alert you whenever you will have malaria in this particular case. So therefore, analyzers directly giving you information about malaria again makes it very beautiful for anyone to start working on. Just to show you one case which we had from our uh, hematology analyzer here and it calls it infected red blood cells which is otherwise what is called the malaria flag and when you look at it the malaria flag you're able to see two distinct cell populations within the neutrophilic series and this particular second population is nothing but parasitized red blood cells which are not getting lysed and eventually you're picking them on a three-dimensional plot as well. And when you see it on the smear, you're able to get your malarial parasite very distinctly and calling it malaria. Now let's move uh, to the last, uh, second last disease that I'm trying to discuss about, and that's about leptospirosis. Fortunately, in Delhi, this is not as common as we have seen it happening in Mumbai. And that's primarily because the flooding is more often seen in Mumbai than in Delhi. And it has been associated with animals, especially rats, as well as pigs, etc. And this Leptospira bacteria is supposed to be excreted in the urine of these organisms, of these animals, which is coming into the water. And once somebody is walking into the water with any cuts and wounds, the Leptospira finds its way into the organ, into the individual's body, and thus starts the disease. Now. There is a study which has been published in uh, one of the journals. I don't have a direct, uh, you know, experience of working on leptospirosis, but she's my alma mater from my place of work, uh, where I studied. And she has published this data where she's talked about serial changes in complete blood counts in patients with leptospirosis. And what's very striking and interesting is that you have uh, changes which are happening in the total leukocyte count, which is wherein you have a higher total leukocyte counts and this is corresponding 
even on the severity part of it, the severe disease will have a much higher count compared to the milder disease. And then when you look at the disease with respect to absolute neutrophil counts, it's reflective of a higher neutrophilic count in these patients, both in severe as well as in milder disease. And interestingly, the other important aspect which starts happening in them is the platelet counts. Interestingly, the platelets do not really significantly go down and they remain on a much slightly lower levels. Eventually, they come back to normal. And this is these are the serial changes which have been seen in leptospirosis. It just gives you an indication. So what if you look at these changes vis-a-vis -vis lymphocytes, monocytes, neutrophils and other values. So there is something called polymorphonuclear maximal value, which is seen more often going predominantly much higher in uh, severe infections. And this is not a surprise because, again, leptospirosis is more like a bacteria and therefore the disease is more spread on the lines of a bacterial infection. And again, if you look at the neutrophils itself and on them, if you try to see the expression of various activation markers, which include CD15, CD182, TLR2, etc., all of them that get activated and they give you an activated neutrophilic component in leptospirosis. So therefore, when you're looking at conditions like this, you will be able to pick them up from this analyzer as well. Now, last but not the least, we cannot forget COVID-19. I know it is not a seasonal disease specifically, but within the time period of uh, monsoons, we also start happening what is called the cough and the cold, and you have to differentiate it from COVID, and that's where the biggest challenge comes today. So if you look at COVID today, there is a very interesting parameter which becomes extremely important, and that is the absolute lymphocyte count, where you look at what is called lymphopenia, which gives you the, con the disease severity, talks about disease severity. And at the same time, if you have what is called the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, which is also prominently seen in the horrible analyzers, and this particular NLR ratio itself is able to give you a lot of information as to how this patient is going to behave in COVID. So, and this is another analyzer from where you get these high fluorescent cells, which are giving you a high peroxidase value, of course, seen in COVID as well. And if you look at a case study of coronavirus infected patient, what happens is that you have these WBC counts and the neutrophilic counts, which go up significantly. And as you become better, they start coming down. But what is more important is that you have lymphopenia, which is most pronounced feature, which you see in this particular case. In addition to that, you're also able to see what is called the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. And at the same time, you're also able to look at the C-reactive protein. Now, let's say if there is a hematology analyzer, which is able to give you the lymphocyte values, the neutrophil values, NLR values, and CRP at the same time, this will make your life wonderful because you're able to get all this information in one single shot and you're able to get the information so quickly that you will be able to take a decision quickly as well. This happens in one of these analyzers from Horeba as well. And of course, there are a few other vendors who give us this kind of information quickly at the button. Just to give you some more information about how NLR has been used by various uh, uh, you know, study groups to differentiate various subtypes, they have actually divided the patients into two age groups of less than 50 and more than 50. And in them also, they have looked at NLR of less than 3.13 and more than 3.13. And they have realized that patients who are less than 50 with NLR of less than 3.13, uh, they can be just kept at home. And the ones which are more than 3.13 can be kept in an isolation ward. Of course, this has changed in our scenario today. And then when you have age group of more than 50, in NLR of less than 3.13, you can put them in isolation ward and look at the respiratory monitoring. Whereas if you have an NLR of more than 3.13, you need to transfer them to ICU because these are the patients who will need the critical care. Thus, NLR becomes an important aspect to be working on and keeping in mind that this needs to be something which one needs to keep in mind. There is also a study where people have correlated NLR and REW standard deviation together as an indicator. And if you look at this study, they've talked about this. There's a factor how they calculate it. I do not have the details right now on a slide, but I can always share it with you where they have talked about NLR and REW together and basis that they have found a factor of 1.06. And they have found that when you have an LNR and RDW factor of more than 1.06, there is a high probability of severe deterioration. Thus, NLR becomes an important aspect, especially in the COVID times. So if you look at all this, we need to keep in mind that you can also look at the lymphocyte models. This is, again, another important aspect to be kept keeping in mind, where you look at the days from the time of illness 
and then you look at the lymphocytic percentages and depending upon the lymphocyte percentage you are actually able to differentiate them into the categories where they will be needing this kind of tree you know uh, segregation so any person who is critically ill with a lymphocyte count of less than 5%, it is preferable to put them in an ICU. So therefore, again, the hematology analyzer comes to be of paramount importance for you to take a decision with respect to uh, the lymphocyte count as well. Just to give you uh, an understanding with respect to CBC, CRP, malaria, etc., this is a very nice table which uh, fortunately Ankur has shared with me. And I'm just showing it to you. What you can see is you are able to very clearly differentiate between the viral infection, bacterial infection, parasitic infection, and COVID-19 at the same time using these algorithms where the total count, the differential count, and the CRP is available to you together. And you can see that the specificity and sensitivity becomes very high, especially the sensitivity is pretty high for both malaria and parasitemia. And you are able to get a very clear indication whether you're dealing with COVID in a patient who is having cold. So therefore, it becomes important for us to have an analyzer on board which can give us CBC, CRP, NLR, and other CBC features wherein we are able to take a conscious call of what the patient is having. Last but not the least, it is important for us to remember that all of us who are behind the scenes, who are actually driving the machine, are extremely important. And they are the ones who have to take a call of giving you the information. So man behind the machine still remains the most important person to handle this whole activity. And thank you very much. I hope uh, this was useful to all of you. I uh, sincerely hope that you stay safe and hopefully from monsoon diseases as well as from COVID. And uh, good luck and goodbye. Thank you very much. If you're there, any, any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, thank you, sir, for addressing us in such a wonderful manner. This was an uh, informative and very interesting presentation. Everyone present here would agree with me. It has everything into it. You covered almost all diseases, monsoon related diseases, in a very beautiful manner. And Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll go to the questions. Some questions I have got to mail. I'll start with that. Sure. Except first question. Uh, recently, an article has been published in one of the international journals regarding use of machine learning and artificial intelligence to predict SARS-CoV-2 infection from full blood counts in a population. Uh, what do you have to say about this, sir? So uh, I, have, I have gone through one of those articles. In fact, there are about five or six articles with respect to machine learning and artificial intelligence and COVID. Most of these articles are based on the fact that they will be looking at the lymphocyte count, the NLR values, the uh, you, you know, the RDW values and stuff like that. And then they will create an algorithm basis which they will be able to predict. But unfortunately, even till date, most of these are not able to predict it beyond a sensitivity level of 75 to 80 percent. So therefore, uh, while it is a good thing for us to know about it, and it is also helpful in at least making sure that we go ahead with testing or not go ahead with testing, it may not become uh, something which is like the standard of care, uh, you know, for us to take care of it. Having said that, one very important thing which we must keep in mind is that when we have a patient, you know, who is COVID and we are having the value of CRP along with the lymphocyte counts, it will actually help us monitor this patient very beautifully with respect to prognostication and shifting the patient to the ICU or not shifting to the ICU. So I, I'm pretty optimistic that it is going to help us in due course of time, but uh, a little too early for us to take it, you know, directly. Okay, sir. Uh, so you mean to say that CRP and lymphocytes are like big parameters for COVID monitoring? Absolutely, they are. See, currently, if you look at it, there are only uh, two or three other parameters which are important when you look at COVID. Of course, interleukin-6, everybody wants to monitor because somehow it's been seen that it is the most uh, reliable marker out of all the inflammatory markers. But the next best reliable marker other than interleukin-6 is CRP and D-dimer. So therefore, if somebody is able to get hold of the lymphocyte count, look at the lymphopenias and get the CRP values at the same time, you will be able to predict the severity of the disease in almost about 75 to 80 percent of the cases, which is pretty good. Right, sir. Uh, so uh, as you also discussed about the flagging of uh, Horiba, you are aware that uh, our Humagen H550 is now having a separate flag for uh, falciferum, vivex, and separate flag, uh, flag for dengue also. So, sir, yes. what about the, uh, like, um, uh, the, uh, there is no absolute sensitivity and specificity in flagging. 
so you, what you have to say about the flagging and sensitivity and so uh, if we go by sensitivity and specificity and uh, you know so if we have to remember one very important thing with any of the analyzers there are two types of flags which we will have to keep in mind one is called the definitive flag and the other one is called a suspect flag and obviously when you are setting up your suspect flags it has a lot to do with you also how you have defined that suspect flag in your analyzer now let's say that you know a company is uh, for that matter horeba or any other vendor is coming up with us with a particular flag and that flag has been validated in their setting it is and it is put it as a suspect flag in all these suspect flags what is expected of you is one to review a smear and number two to ensure that you know you are really going to go ahead uh, and investigate that patient for that particular disease for instance if there is a dengue flag which is coming up on the horeba uh, analyzer and it says there is a possibility of dengue i would go ahead and start testing for dengue in this patient similarly if i have a malaria flag which is being flagged up by the analyzer i will surely want to go now and see the thick smear of this patient and analyze whether i'm really getting that or not because again you have to understand that analyzers are not really identifying the parasite they are identifying the non lysed red blood cells and many a times you may not be 101% sure vis-a-vis -vis whether it's malaria or not malaria but most importantly if the analyzer is able to sensitize you to go and have a review of the smear nothing like that life becomes much easier for any one of us handling malaria especially in the season that we are in uh, uh dr ankur if you allow me can yes, i sure doctor sure doctor let's go ahead it was seen on the screen so there was one question by one of the, the doctor or the gentleman he had asked me if we have all this flagging system being available in this uh, the analyzers oh uh, especially for malaria so will there be a need of uh, looking into the smears or not or are we trying to remove the smear readings so for all practical purposes as i just answered you know it is the man behind the machine and this slide is very very important to remember the point is when we are looking at any analyzer giving me a flag of malaria any analyzer for that matter it is not a definitive flag it's a suspect flag why is it a suspect flag is because it is not a 100% sure identification of malarial parasite you've not seen it you know you've not really seen the parasite you're only looking at those cells which are unlysed red blood cells or maybe a hemozoin pigment which is there in say the wbcs etc from where you're picking it up now unless you see the parasite on the smear you cannot be sure that it's a parasite indeed so therefore our jobs will still remain we will have to verify it on the smear and then give a value but there is one very interesting thing which happens because of the malarial flagging and that's the moment you get a malaria flag and you validated it on the smear subsequently your monitoring of the patient can be done on the machine itself because that will give you an idea of how the parasites are going down in terms of percentages so it is an it is a very good flag and yet it needs to be validated by looking at the smear right i think uh, 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 the the man behind the machine will never be out of uh, especially in the field of pathology at least i mean whatever comes up uh, from the instrument analyzers we are still very much of a sticky kind okay i need to go and look back into the smear even Absolutely. if like a machine is giving you a flag of like blast or uh, malaria or thalassemia screening yeah i mean that is that is absolutely true and uh, uh, do you think sir i mean uh, there has to be an understanding of uh, the the laboratory professional especially the doctor sitting in the laboratory and what is going parallelly with the advancement of the uh, the technology uh, has to be known each other okay, how does this functionality is going to help us uh, redefining our workflow redefining our the way we look up to the disease and uh, as a shocker now i mean we have this covid also we don't know how many more shockers are going to come up uh, in the uh, coming time so is technology uh, really going to be a part and parcel of our lives especially in the laboratory medicines and do we how much do we need to rely on these aspects so uh, i couldn't agree more with you dr prakash the idea is that you know we need to keep on upgrading the point is uh, many many years back when i did my post graduation i would only trust the analyzer to look at a white blood cell count the hemoglobin and the platelets 
to a date today where I'm actually looking at all the scatter plots. And in fact, a lot of information is actually taken from the analyzer. Artificial intelligence is being used in the middleware and basis that a lot of reports are getting released. Now, why is that happening? Because you have been able to upgrade the instruments to that level. And those upgraded information needs to be upgraded within our minds as well. So I am in complete agreement with you when you say that all of us need to keep on updating our knowledge with respect to the machine itself. And we also need to start trusting the machine. I'm not saying trust it blindly, but start trusting the machine. And at the same time, be comfortable with the machine. And only then we will be able to give the best possible results. More importantly, time matters a lot. And therefore, machines help you to reduce the time. I'm sure a lot of you would have seen the movie, uh, you know, uh, Three Idiots, where Amir Khan said, machine is something which reduces your burden. And that's what you want to do. Your aim is to ensure that you get the machine in such a way, you understand the machine in such a way, you use artificial intelligence as much as you can. And all these newer parameters which are coming up in these instruments are phenomenally good. And they are actually helping you to pick up a lot of information about various diseases at the drop of the hat. So I'm in complete agreement with you. And we need to upgrade. And that's something which is very important. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for uh, I mean uh, highlighting and uh, this part because uh, most of the time we sometimes we are actually yes we need to go back to our basics but I think we need to also keep on upgrading ourselves wherein we can uh, the help is uh, provided by uh, the instruments or say machines uh, especially in our field nowadays and this is what we had seen also the growth has happened in uh, in terms of hematology analyzers also in terms of the biochemical analyzers or the immunoassays or and many more which are going to be common. And over to you, Dr. Ankur. I mean, uh, uh. yeah, thank you, Dr. Prakash. Uh, so, with this monsoon season approaching, I'm sure dengue and malaria cases are, are on rise. COVID is already there. These hemat analyzers will be a definite solution for many diseases. And this will come as a boost to diagnosis, early diagnosis, I will say, because uh, this is available and accessible everywhere. Absolutely. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. Uh, so one more question. What is your view on future of medical learning and artificial intelligence based predictive flagging on routine hematology analyzers, just like full blood count with respect to the fever investigation? Okay, so uh, there are two. I would answer it in two ways. One is uh, what is available, and one is uh, what is my wish list. And I will touch my wish list first. My wish list would be that I would push the uh, sample into an analyzer, and in the report it will tell me this is dengue, and this is what his status is, and he's likely to get into a dengue hemorrhagic fever, and you know you should take these, these precautions. Wow, if that would happen, that would be something phenomenal. Similarly, on a malaria or on a typhoid or stuff like that. Now, we are possibly going in that direction. If you look at it, the analyzer from your uh, uh, concern itself, where we're looking at NLR, CRP, as well as at the same time, the CBC parameters, which includes lymphocyte values, all coming together from just one analyzer. And all this is coming out in just about less than a minute. And we are able to get that machine learning into the picture where all these data, which is coming from all of them together, is being analyzed for the probabilities of various disorders, right? And that gives us an information to take it further and say, okay, this patient is likely to be having dengue, or this patient is more likely to have COVID, or this patient is more likely to have malaria. Now, when this kind of a thing would happen from the machine, that would make it phenomenal. The only challenge which I see at this point of time is, after all, it is the man who's making the machine and not the vice versa. So therefore, it is still not 100% foolproof. We still have about 70-80%, you know, that, that kind of a sensitivity, which we have to grapple with. I'll be actually very, very happy, and I really wish for it that we would reach somewhere around 95 to you know 98% sensitivity and almost specificity to that extent, which would make it very, very good for all of us. Um, thank you, sir, for explaining it so well. Uh, being... Uh... In the IVT industry, we are trying our best to come up with new parameters which can help in the diagnosis. And in today's presentation, you know, this high frozen cell was actually the new thing. And I didn't, I didn't know it's so well correlated with the platelet count and this thing. And oh, okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very so much. I, 
yes i don't think there are more questions so dr prakash you want to ask anything no no i think we are uh, we have done a lot of i mean uh, uh, good uh, interaction conversation and a good uh, i mean i will say the knowledge sharing has been done and it's always wonderful to have uh, uh, dr handu on stage because i am personally uh, uh, a, a believer in him and as well as i have learned a lot from him so is thrown a very good light on uh, every possible aspect in a very subtle and a very simple way and uh, yes stages didn't run but yeah he was like a rajdhani because i know rajdhani since my childhood so it was a rajdhani speed which is very smooth and you have all the luxuries which are there within that uh, particular train so this happened here and i'm really thankful to him to take out his time from his busy schedule and uh, to give us the knowledge and put light on us so over to you dr rangur i think we are good to wind up now yeah yeah actually no more questions okay basically sir presented in such a beautiful manner there was not much scope for for the questions thank you uh, thank you very much thank you thank you sir for taking out all your precious time and for such a beautiful presentation i also thank my audience and by this i wind up the seminar webinar and thank you so much all of you for your precious time thank you sir thank you everyone thank you bye bye have a great day